Hi everybody, this is Mr. Folly, and welcome to Podcast 1.2, we're going to go over Adam History. We're going to learn who Democritus, Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, Bohr, those are a bunch of dudes who did some stuff, and the current model that you absolutely need to know. So let's hop right into it. Theories change over time. Democritus had the idea of the atom, by the way, we're looking at atomic history, of the atom, but he was the laughing philosopher. Why? He had no evidence. Now, what Democritus said was, if you have a chunk of something, can you cut it in half? Yes. Can you cut it in half again? Yes. Can you cut it in half again? Yes. Does a time come where you can't cut it in half anymore? <laughs> the answer is yes. So when it is so small, it is indivisible. That means there are particles that you can't cut anymore. The Greek word for that is atomos which is where his idea of everything's made of little indivisible parts called atoms. Now, Dalton made this thing a big boy thing because he actually had evidence. Now, Dalton's model is missing most of our common knowledge of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And it had some things that were wrong. Atoms are indestructible. Mm, sorry, Dalton, that's not true if we do nuclear reactions. Now, you and I, we don't do nuclear reactions, so it's true for us, but it's not true for the world. Atoms of the same element are identical. Now, we think that they have the same properties, but there are isotopes. If you remember from biology, they do a little bit about it. Some of these have different um, masses. And they just vary a little bit. And that affects whether they're radioactive or not. But for us, it's just masses differ slightly. Compounds are a combination of atoms. This is absolutely true. Instead of a combination, I should say a bonded combination of atoms. Remember how that's a compound? Um, atoms are rearranged in reactions, so they change their partners. And that part's right, too. Way to go, Dalton. Dalton's model is missing protons, neutrons, electrons, a nucleus, and what the electrons do. But he did have some evidence that supported it. The evidence is really mathematical and confusing, but I think you'll believe me that it's there. Thompson was the next dude. Thompson saw every atom could emit light that would bend. This thing right here, and you should write this down, is called the cathode ray tube. So you need to know he had the cathode ray tube experience, experiment. And what he found out is that if he put energy into anything, if I put some energy into this, every single piece of matter in the world would shoot a green beam of light. And what he found out was that if you put a magnet, now I know this looks like a horseshoe, but to me this is what magnets look like on cartoons. If this is a positive magnet, the light would bend towards it. So what that meant was that every atom has a negative part. Okay? Because light doesn't normally bend. Okay? So, ah. Thompson's model is called the plum pudding model. It changed the billiard ball model because... Atoms had negative parts. And I'm not, uh, those are called electrons. Oh. And his model is called plum pudding, and it looks like a chocolate chip cookie. Plum pudding is pudding that has little pieces of plum skin in it to do that. Now, I apologize. Dalton's model was just a ball. Dalton. And it's called the billiard ball. Boop. Okay. He changed the billiard ball model because he added parts that were electrons. So this generic part was a positive mass, and the dots were electrons. His evidence was all atoms have a negative part. As shown by the magnetic cathode ray tube. Okay? Hope you wrote all that down, including the pictures. Rutherford saw most went through, but not all. Now, what happened was Rutherford had this radioactive source, and he shot these pretty big particles. Okay, they were alpha particles, and he shot these things through gold foil. Gold foil is one of the thinnest 
one of the thinnest things we can get. You can take a hammer and just beat on gold so it's so thin you can see through it. And this stuff we're talking about like 1900s. We're talking a long time ago where you don't have great technology. One of the thinnest things, and he was shooting these molecules. Now the molecules, you couldn't, even see, you couldn't see them very much, but this fluorescent screen, you could see them if it hit like a photographic screen and make a little light pop thing. So he shot these um, particles at it, and he described it as shooting cannonballs through wet tissue. And normally, if you do something 99 times and one time it doesn't work, you go, eh, that's all right. But imagine if you're shooting cannonballs at wet tissue paper and one time it bounces off. You go, whoa, um, I need to explain that. And he explained it by saying there's a small, dense, positive, that small, dense, positive nucleus. And the atom is mostly empty space. So the atom is mostly empty space. Um, and it, the nucleus would be the size of a soccer ball in Soldier Field. So really, 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 really small. Okay? So what the world expected when Rutherford did his experiment, everything shot through because this is the plum pudding model. And what really happened was a couple of these things. This N is nucleus. And because the particles we're shooting are positive, when it got to the nucleus, it didn't stick. It bounced off. Rutherford's experiment added a positive small nucleus. And the evidence was positive particles bounced off. gold foil, but only rarely. And to make that rarely make some sense, if I'm blindly shooting things and my hole is this big, I'm just like throwing bowling balls, okay? If 10 of them go through, then you know the hole is relatively 10. If I make it this big and only one of them goes through, then you know that it's the hole is smaller. Same type of deal. So the number of bowling balls that went through would be one. That would say that this hole is smaller. He did the same type of deal. Bohr saw different atoms gave different lines, not a blend. So Bohr would shoot light or energy at an atom. And what would happen is normally if, you know, you hit somebody, they go, ow, and you hear all kinds of ranges of that. Um, when they shot energy at an atom, you didn't hear, ow, you heard, eh, ooh, and it would be specific targeted lines. So that meant that there had to be energy levels where electrons either fell, boom, all the way down, boom, one level, but they could never be in between. And that's called a quantum. So Bohr learned there are all or nothing quantum energy levels. Okay, So that means electrons jump. Now, I honestly prefer the word teleport, but no one else does. Um, because they never exist in between. They jump, teleport between levels. And that would be like a ladder. If you're on a ladder, you can be on rung number one, two, three, or four, but you cannot be on rung 3.2. Right? And the evidence is energy is not emitted all the way through. And that would be a rainbow. So if Bohr's model was wrong, what would happen is you'd get this whole barcode thing. This would be all colored and it would be all totally black. And what he got was just a few. So why just a few? Because this is the spots where the electrons can land. The evidence is energy is not emitted all the way through in specific bands. And they're called bands. Show. Dig. The quantum mechanical theory is correct. You need to know quantum mechanical theory. Quantum mechan. Oh, Bohr's model was called the planetary model. And what Bohr thought, it's what you learned in elementary school. Bohr thought there was a nucleus and then there would be rings around it. And this is what, this was Bohr's idea. Okay. Quantum mechanical theory is correct. That means the other ones are wrong. 
Electrons exist in clouds. Just a quick little picture. You don't need to draw this, but see how those are not rings? They're weird donut-shaped clouds or puffy-shaped clouds. And we can predict where they probably are. Probably. <laughs> Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We either know the direction or the location, but not both the direction and the location. So instead of calling um, electron pass orbitals or rings, I'm sorry, instead of calling them orbits, we call them orbitals. Rings are wrong. 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 Protons, I think you know this. Protons are in the nucleus. They tell you the I identity. Now, this is new. Electrons are in clouds outside of the nucleus, and they tell you the reactivity and the charge. Neutrons are in the nucleus. They tell you the stability and the mass. And you need to be able to know it. So I say, um, what particle determines how reactive an element is? Chemical reactivity, that's the electron. Um, what particle tells you whether something is helium or oxygen? Identity is helium or oxygen, that would be the proton. Review. You should know Dalton, Rutherford, Thompson, and Bohr. So you should be able to say um, billiard ball, plum pudding model, and then these guys both get planetary. Models, billiard ball, or plum pl pudding, planetary. Quantum mechanical is the right one and what the experiments did. And that is it. And I should have been playing music, but I didn't. So I'll just say 